Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who makes, and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with, with praise. praise. Whoa. <laughs> now I'm heard, right? Can everybody hear? Here we go. Welcome to the service, friends. Is that better? Can I ask a big favor? As we begin our worship service, can I ask those of you that are way back to come closer? So we can all have more of a sense of community.
Praise God. Thank you so much. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Let us pray. Lord, it is a joy to gather in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to offer you, our Heavenly Father, worship worthy of you and worship worthy of your Son. And we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit among us tonight. Lord, I pray that you would have your way with us. We offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices, and we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand and sing, To God Be the Glory, number 66. Our next hymn is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, number 262.
Now we have the privilege of Ministry in Music by Carrie Clausen and Jack Tenkate. Jesus for his cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a flowing fountain for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Oh, glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Thank you, Jack and Carrie. We're the people who know the good news. Amen? Amen. And we experience that. It's a joy to be among you tonight. When uh, my friend Mike Pitzenberger uh, mentioned that he would not be here, and he offered me the opportunity to come. It is a joy for me to be here. Uh, Mike and I go back to being fellow seminarians at Western Seminary a long time ago. <laughs> and um, over the years, we have been able to maintain contact. Uh, when Beth and I had the opportunity to serve as RCA missionaries, uh, Mike was serving in a number of our supporting churches, so we've been able to maintain contact with him over the years. And what a joy it is that Mike Pitzenberger is now your pastor. So you know you are a blessed people and uh, grateful for this opportunity tonight. Let us go uh, before the Lord in a time of prayer. And before I do that, I want to wish all of you fathers a happy Father's Day. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be able to gather in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And because of his work on the cross and all he has accomplished, we know you, Lord God Almighty, as our Father, our Heavenly Father. And Lord, on this Father's Day, we are most grateful that you, the Lord God who created the universe, who made all things, spoke the very, ex uh, the very things of the universe into existence. Lord, what a joy it is that we can know you as an amazing Father. Lord, with that in mind, we want to lift up to you all of the congregation's families. Father, we need renewal in our own day, and we pray that you'd strengthen families, strengthen fathers to be very, very good leaders in their homes, strengthen families to be a coherent unit that sub we pray for the children to be submissive to both their moms and their dads. And Lord, we pray for unity and strengthening of families in this day. We pray that you would give grace to fathers to effectively lead their families, to sacrificially love their wife and guide their children. And Lord, we acknowledge too, as we approach the 4th of July, we pray for this nation. Lord, we know that the United States of America is facing lots of challenges. We know, Lord, also that nothing is too hard for you. And we pray for our leaders, governors, the president, the cabinet, Lord, we pray that our government would submit themselves to your lordship. We pray that they would seek wisdom to know how to rule effectively. And we pray, Lord, that our nation would experience a turning back to you, the living God. So, Lord, we, we invite your Holy Spirit to do great things in this nation. Lord, we also know that we stand in, in need of spiritual revival. Nothing less, Lord, will help our nation in these days. So Lord, that is what we ask for. We pray for spiritual renewal across our nation. And Lord, we pray for this hurting world we pray that the church of Jesus Christ throughout this world would rise up, serve Jesus and the kingdom of God, be led and guided by the Holy Spirit, rediscover the absolute truth and confidence of Holy Scripture. Lord, we pray that from each pulpit, the word of God would be faithfully proclaimed and believed. We pray for the Holy Spirit to move powerfully upon your people. And we pray that we would be obedient to your word and to the leading of your Holy Spirit in this day. Lord, we pray again, strengthening of our families, that you'd renew us, that you would make us a praying people who take all of our needs to you, Lord. We pray that we would be obedient to the Great Commission and that we would live out the Great Commandments. And so, Lord, we pray blessing on this congregation. We pray that the Overrisal Reformed Church would be very faithful to what you call them to do. And we pray for the strengthening of your whole church around the world. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray these things. Amen. It's fitting that we sing, we stand and sing, O God, our help in ages past. Let's do verses 1, 2, 3, and 6.
be seated. The scripture reading for tonight is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. A great passage. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized Peter, he put him in prison delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And Peter did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And Peter went out and followed the angel. He did not know what he was, that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many people were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, You are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, Peter described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then Peter departed and went to another place. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God truly stands forever. Amen? Amen. James 5 verse 13 says, Is any one of you in trouble? They should pray. The early church faced much trouble. They actually had one crisis after another. And now we're living in a time where we have a lot of trouble. I don't need to tell you what we've all sort of been through in the last, what, 16 months with COVID, with this crazy time of pandemic. 
and all that it is involved, all of the implications. We also are living in a time of growing hostility to truth, growing hostility to the one true and biblical faith. You may not know it, but all over the world, persecution is on the increase. In some places of the world, persecution is a serious issue. And we've managed in our history to escape a lot of persecution, but it could very, very well be that we're approaching a time in our own nation. Then there's the growing threat of apostasy. A remarkable thing is happening before our eyes, and that is we are seeing people depart from the truth to follow after doctrines taught by demons. We're living in strange times, friends. But I want to bring you good news today, and that is this. The same God who answered the prayers of the early church when they called an emergency prayer meeting is the same God that we serve today. And it is still true that whatever we need from God, the proper way to attain that is still to go to him in prayer and to ask him. Amen? Amen. Amen. I've entitled the message, Praying in Troubled Times. And we are indeed in troubled times. I want us to take a closer look at this passage. I'm more familiar with it in the NIV, but this is a good translation. And uh, so I'm going to read it from the one that's in your pew Bibles. After that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Who is this Herod? Well, you know, there's actually a whole bunch of different Herods in, in our New Testament. This happens to be Herod Agrippa, King Herod Agrippa, and he comes from a long line of some really bad Herods. This would be the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the man that the Magi approached when Jesus the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem. Magi came from the east with gifts, and they came to King Herod the Great, and they said, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We've been following his star from the east, and we've come to worship him. Can you tell us where to go? Well, we read that in the Gospels that Herod was greatly disturbed. And when Herod is disturbed, then all Jerusalem is disturbed, and for good reason. So he calls together the chief priests and the prophets, and, and, and he asks them, where is the Messiah to be born? And they said, Bethlehem. So he tells the Magi, and then he tells the Magi, as soon as you find him, go and search for him, and when you do, come back so that I too can go and worship him. But in reality, we know that King Herod had murder in his heart. And so the Lord warned the Magi after they had met the Lord and delivered their gifts to leave Jerusalem and, go and return to their own country by another route. So he ne they never did go back. King Herod was so enraged, he did a search for the child and had every child two years old, every, every male child two years old and younger killed in the area of Bethlehem. That's Herod the Great. This was his grandson. He was also the nephew of Herod Antipas. That's the one that had John the Baptist's head placed on a platter after Herodias' daughter had done a wonderful dance in front of guests. It was also the one that Jesus appeared to on Good Friday at his trial. That's the nephew. Anyways, it's a long line of bad Herods, and this Herod's no better than those that came before him. And so he decides 
that he's going to gain some points among the unbelieving Jews, unbelieving in terms of Jesus as the Messiah, and he'd score some points. And he has James, the son of Zebedee, brother to John, killed with the sword. When he sees that he gains them political favor, he says, well, if killing one of the apostles is good, how about a second? And he decides to arrest Peter, Simon Peter, who at this point is really the leader of the Jerusalem church at this stage. And if we looked at the context, we would see that in the chapters immediately preceding chapter 12, the Lord had done something wonderful with Peter. And that is, he had led him, he had given him a vision, and some men from Cornelius came from Caesarea looking for him. He was told by the Holy Spirit to go with him. He ends up sharing the gospel with these Gentiles, these Romans, and the Holy Spirit comes on all of them. And to Peter's amazement, the Holy Spirit's given even to the Gentiles. And it's the beginning of the Gentile mission. Undoubtedly, King Herod is hoping to stop this. But you know, as bad as Herod is, and Herod's on a rampage, friends, you have to look behind the scenes and you realize that he's not public enemy number one to the church. It's Satan that's public enemy number one to the church. He's working behind the scenes. He's working through Herod. And he wants to shut down the mission to the Gentiles. What better way than to have Peter killed? And so Peter is arrested. But the good news is, is he's arrested during Passover. And not one, you know, what happens every Passover is you have thousands and thousands of Jews come from all over the country and even from far off so that they can celebrate this great festival. They don't want a riot. And so he realizes we're going to need to wait for the Passover to be completed. Then we'll bring him out for a public trial and execute him. And so by the time we're reading this account, Peter's already been in prison about a week. The early church recognizes we've already lost one of our key apostles, James, and now Peter's next. So what did they do? The only wise thing, gather the people together and pray. And it says in verse 5 that, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was going up for him by the church. Earnest prayer. If you look in the Greek, the original language, it's ektenas. It means stretch outedly. It means that they're praying day in and day out, fervently, like they're not going to give up. That's the kind of prayer that was going up for Peter. They didn't want to lose another apostle. And so they prayed stretch outedly. Now, what did Jesus taught us to pray? Stretch outedly. If we look at passages like Luke chapter 11, turn in your Bibles to Luke 11, <clears throat> verses 5 through 10. The NIV says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend. And he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine has come on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. But the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though you will not give, get up and give him the bread because he's his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. One version says the man's audacity. 
In other words, he just won't go away until he gets what he needs. And Jesus is saying, that's the way I want you to pray. I want you to pray as if it all counts on your prayers and don't let go until you get what you need. Ask with boldness and be persistent. In another place, he talks about an unjust judge. And a, and a woman who is demanding justice goes to an unjust judge that cares nothing for the people. But because the widow won't go away, she just keeps coming back, the unjust judge gives, gives, the, woman, she, she gives the woman exactly what she's asking for because she's so tired, the judge is tired of dealing with the woman. And then the Lord says, we don't have a heavenly father like that. But we want you to pray to your heavenly father like that. Because if you do, he'll give you justice. If the unjust judge will give justice to the woman because she keeps bothering him, how much more will our heavenly father who is good give us what we stand in need of? And so we're told by Jesus things like this. So I say unto you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And when you actually look in the Greek, you see that it's in the continuous present, which means repeatedly. A better translation would be, so I say unto you, keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For anyone who keeps on asking, will, will, it will be given. If they keep on seeking, they will find. If they keep on knocking, the door will finally be opened. Jesus is actually encouraging us to stay at it until the breakthrough comes. And that's the way the early church was doing it. We've already lost one. We don't want to lose another. Lord, please spare Peter. Deliver him. Now you look at the human situation and it looks impossible. We read that there's actually double, a double security system going on here. This is unusual. King Herod wants to make sure nothing's going to happen to Peter. He's not going anywhere. He's going to stay put until the Passover is done. Then we're going to bring him out, have a quick public trial, and we're going to execute him. There's no human failure here. This is four squads of four each. Count them. Do the math. Sixteen men are watching Peter. He's got chains on. It's the middle of the night. It's the night before the trial. You can imagine how well rested they are. But the church is praying. And friends, we read that it's the third or fourth hour. In other words, the, the third or fourth watch of the night. This would be like three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. They've been praying all night. Stretch outedly. And then we see what happens. Suddenly an angel appears and a light shone in the cell. Quick, Peter, get up. Now, you look at this and it's like, what's really going on here? We, we are getting the report of one angel who's come into the visible realm, right? But do you think that there was one angel at work here or do you think there was a multitude of angels working here. Do you think that the gates opened up by themselves? Do you think that all of the guards suddenly weren't paying attention? I think there was a whole bunch of angels at work here. It's just that only one of them has become visible to Peter. And Peter gets woken up. He's told what to do. He grabs his sandal. He puts on his clothes and he starts walking out. 
And then the gates open. Undoubtedly, the invisible angels are at work here. This is an operation. God is doing something amazing here. He's responding to the prayers of his people. It's so surreal that even Peter doesn't believe that it's really happening. It isn't until he's actually out of the prison, he's walked a full block, and the angel disappears, that he suddenly realizes, aha, it's not a dream, it's not a vision, it's really happening. And when he does, what does he, con what does he conclude? There must be a prayer meeting going on. It's the only explanation. And he thinks, where would it be taking place? Undoubtedly, at Mary's, the mother of John Mark, because she had, a, she had a rather large place. We know she had at least one servant girl. We know that there's an outer court. That's unusual, but it makes sense because that's where they usually held emergency prayer meetings. It was large enough to contain as many of the believers as would come together and pray. How many of you remember the days when churches actually used to gather for prayer meetings? Do you remember that? You know, it's one of the most poorly attended events now. There's a lot of congregations that, that don't even bother to have prayer meetings. Why have a prayer meeting? We can't get people to come together. Friends, we need to go back to the scriptures. When they were in trouble, they prayed. They gathered the people together. And there was more power in gathering the people together than there was just saying, just pray for this on your own. What's the problem with that when we say, just pray on your own? What's one of the problems? How many of us honestly go and actually spend some time praying? That's one of the problems. Another problem is, is that sometimes when we're alone, it's harder to believe and, 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 and pray with any expectancy. But when you gather as a group, those that have expectancy can help those that have less. There's more power in the prayer. There's a wonderful passage. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm just going to go right to it. There's a wonderful passage in Matthew that talks about the power of corporate prayer. Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Jesus says, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. There's power in a corporate prayer meeting. When brothers and sisters gather together and pray, there's power. And prayer changes the situation. Prayer calls for God's intervention and invites God's presence, God's power. We're asking for resources from heaven to come down to the earth. That's exactly what's going on here in this answer to prayer. It's an amazing answer to prayer. There's so many lessons to learn from this. You know, sometimes, I mean, how many of you honestly can say, I'm satisfied with my prayer life. I always see results every time I pray. Thanks for your honesty. I mean, we all struggle with our prayer, with our prayer life. But as we pray and as we see God answer, our faith increases, does it not? And when we come together and we pray very specifically and we see God come through as he did here so supernaturally, our God is not limited by the same laws that govern our lives. We serve a God of miracles, and nothing is too hard for him. 
So we need to have those times when we pray. Beth and I and our family, we saw some wonderful answers to prayer when we were on the mission field. And a number of years ago, um, how many of you know are familiar with Bahrain? We were in Bahrain from 2010 until January of 2019. It's in the Middle East, in the Gulf, one of the Gulf countries right next to Saudi Arabia. And Samuels Weimer was a wonderful RCA missionary who in 1893 uh, came to Bahrain and established the first hospital in the country, the first school for women in the country, and the first Protestant church. And I had the opportunity to, to be the pastor a number of years there at the National Evangelical Church. Well, the American Mission Hospital, which has been such an amazing testimony for so many years, went through a crisis about five years ago. And our, our colleague, George Cherian, saw it coming and started, started asking for people to pray. One day, the board just turned rogue. It had become majority Muslim, and they literally took over the hospital one day. They came, they literally took George's computer, told him he was no longer in charge, put his name and, and two other leaders in the paper and said, don't hire this man, and they were going to kick him out of the country. They literally took over the hospital. What do you do in such a situation? And the right answer is pray. Stretch outedly. Pray fervently. Pray until a breakthrough comes. And that's what God's people did. And we saw God do actually work a miracle. The RCA leadership made a direct appeal to the king and to the American ambassador. And I don't believe it's a coincidence, but the night that that happened, there was a dinner on behalf of the royal family, and the ambassador was there. The ambassador said, or the king said, how are things going? The ambassador says, we've got a, a major problem at the American Mission Hospital. The king said, as soon as the dinner is over, I want you in my chambers, and we'll talk about it. He spent a whole hour with the king. The king heard the whole situation. He said, tomorrow there will be a change. And just like that in a matter of days, the rogue board was removed, a new board was put in place, George was reinstated, and, and literally we went from almost losing the hospital after a 120 year ministry, more than 120 years of ministry, to literally being a, put in a position where it's now expanding rapidly with the king's favor. And, 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 and they've accomplished more in the last five years than they had accomplished in five decades. God's people were praying stretch outedly, fervently, expectantly, and God absolutely supernaturally delivered the American Mission Hospital. And George will tell you it's nothing less than an answer to prayer. It's, it's just a miracle. I want you to know there are amazing things God is doing in the Middle East today. There's a wonderful book I want you to read if you get a chance, Dreams and Visions. It's an account of how, as God's people are praying for the Muslim world to be reached, Jesus is answering by showing up in people's dreams. And it's happening all over the Middle East and all over the world, especially among Muslims. Tom Doyle says that, who would you think is the toughest kind of Muslim to reach? with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What would you think? Terrorist? Do you know that there are terrorists turning to Jesus in this day and age? It's, it's beginning to happen, friends. 
But according to Tom Doyle, he says the hardest person to reach is the imams. The imams are the leaders of the local mosques, and their job is to keep all of those Muslims in line, following every jot and tittle of the Quran. The Muslims fear these imams because they have tremendous power. Government leaders fear them. They tend to be combative, angry, arrogant. They're going to defend Islam at all costs. The people fear the imams. Here's a true story. This occurred in Cairo, Egypt. Hassan woke up startled by a rough hand over his mouth and a cold muzzle of a gun to his head. Get up and follow me. Hassan had been known for his bold evangelizing of Muslims. And so as Hassan followed his kidnapper to a warehouse, he thought, I'm done. Someone's turned me in, and he prayed to the Lord, Lord, help me to be faithful to you to the very end. Help me to be strong, O oh Lord, if I have to suffer. Help me, Lord. So he's taken to an old warehouse where there's 10 very obviously Muslim men in a circle. And he's told to sit down in the middle of the circle. And as he sits down, the kidnapper takes off the mask, puts down his gun, and these 10 men begin to smile at Hassan. And he thought, what is going on? The whole atmosphere changes. The kidnapper says, please forgive me, but we are all imams. And Jesus has appeared to each one of us in the past few years. We've all graduated at the university where you study to be an imam. And Jesus was good enough to reveal himself to us. And we kept silent. We kept it to ourselves for a long time. But after a while, we couldn't keep this good news to ourselves. And we started praying for, for Jesus to help us find other people that we could fellowship with. And so now the 10 of us gather three times a week in the middle of the night so we can pray for our families and we can pray for the people in our mosques that they too will find Jesus. The Holy Spirit led us to you and we have a question for you. Would you be willing to teach us the Bible and show us how to follow Jesus? True story. These are the kinds of things happening, friends. As we pray for God to reveal himself to Muslims, that they would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved, God is answering and doing amazing things. So what, what lessons can we learn from this account and even from what he's doing today? First, there's power in corporate prayer. It is well worth our time. I want to challenge you. Come together. Come together with a few of your friends on a regular basis and pray for the things that need prayer. Pray for your families. Pray for the children. Do you realize what's going on in the schools and what they're being taught? The gender confusion? I've recently begun a Bible study where I'm serving. I'm serving as pastor of, of prayer and discipleship in the Hopkins Church. And we have the, I have the privilege of, of doing a Bible study with 35 young people. Because I know what they're facing, and we're looking at foundations. I'm taking them back to Genesis, to, to the very foundational level. Because I know, I hear what they're being taught in the schools. We're living in an age of confusion because we're living in an age of deception. And we need to pray for our families. We need to pray for the schools. We need to pray for God to intervene. Amen? 
The second lesson we learn, not just the benefits of corporate prayer, but the second is that God will honor our prayer efforts in spite of our personal struggles. That's good news. Can you imagine Peter's at the door, it's four o'clock in the morning and he's knocking and they're not letting him in? Rhoda goes back and they say, oh my goodness, you're out of your mind. Now you'd think they've been praying all of this time that they think, we got our answer. Hallelujah, let's praise the Lord. But it reveals a general consensus of unbelief. They didn't think God was going to answer that prayer. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me. Because God can take the little bit of faith that we have, join it with your faith and my faith, and together we will expect God to do bigger things. We need to gather together and to pray in faith, to pray expectantly. God will honor our prayers, even when we're struggling. The, big, the, the, the last lesson is nothing is impossible for our God. Let us pray expectantly for the seemingly impossible. I'm going to close by reading to you Psalm 11. Because this has been the psalm that I think best describes our time. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? I love that question the psalmist asks. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Friends, what's the answer? We can pray. We can ask God to intervene. It's the only way. Because we can't fix the foundations. Only God can. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence he hates with a passion. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur, and a scorching wind will be their lot. We are reminded, friends, judgment will come. It will come. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. That's Psalm 11, friends. I wrote that down in my Bible. This is the Psalm of 2020 and 2021 in our nation. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can appeal to God, the living God, who has all of the resources that we need. And he's happy to answer our prayers. And he's the God of miracles. Let us pray with great expectation. Let us pray together. Let us believe the Lord can reverse impossible situations. Amen? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage which reveals what happened in the early church when they faced a crisis. And Lord, we, we can learn so much from it. Father, I pray that we will learn to pray expectantly and stay committed to praying until the breakthrough comes. Oh Lord, there's so much to pray for. We pray for our nation, oh God. We pray for this lost and hurting world. Lord, that they would see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that the kingdom of God is coming, whether they acknowledge it or not. Judgment's also coming. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to you, that we would keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, that we would pray and expect your Holy Spirit to move 
through our prayers and to answer us in wonderful and supernatural ways. Even as you did in the first century and so you are doing today. Raise our expectation, Lord. Increase our faith and help us to be faithful to you to pray boldly and persistently till the breakthroughs do come. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let us stand and sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you go forth to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.